was born in London Derry. I was born in Derry City too. Oh, what a special child to see such things and still to smile. I knew that there was something wrong. Before that, though, we deal with some very important matters. I'm delighted to tell you that the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, has agreed to make a very rare appearance on this programme to discuss the unfolding scenes in Northern Ireland. We will be damaging the fabric of the Union with regulatory checks and even customs controls between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. If we genuinely wanted to do free trade deals, if we wanted to cut tariffs on, as we should, by the way, on food from, uh, to make food cheaper for our people, for, from Sub-Saharan Africa or whatever, if we wanted to vary our regulation, then we would have to leave Northern Ireland behind as an economic semi-colony of the EU. And we would be damaging the fabric of the Union with regulatory checks and even customs controls between Great Britain and Northern Ireland on top of those extra regulatory checks down the Irish Sea that are already envisaged in the withdrawal agreement. Now, I have to tell you, no British Conservative government could or should sign up to any such arrangement. Yeah. And so... Oh, sorry, I, I, I was misinformed. I, I thought we were going to be hearing from him today, not, not from what he said in 2018 to the DUP conference, describing his own policies, his own so-called oven-ready deal, as something that no Conservative government could sign up to. It's almost as if the man can't open his mouth without misleading you or lying to you. And I'd love to know whether this still gets filed under her. I love it. I love it when he lies because it upsets people like you. Does it? I don't know. I don't know if you've seen the footage of petrol bombs being thrown into a bus in Belfast. I don't know whether you've seen the, the, the pictures of the, the so-called peace walls that exist between Unionist and uh, Republican areas in Northern Ireland on fire. I don't know, maybe that's what he meant by sunlit uplands, is it? Petrol bomb lit streets, perhaps, was what he had on the agenda. I'm going to play you this again before we get stuck into the story that's unfolding in Northern Ireland as we speak, because it seems to me to be perhaps, and again, it's a very, very crowded field, but it is perhaps the most potent illustration of just how dishonest this entire administration has become and it had to become this dishonest after the referendum result there was no earthly way that you could deliver a brexit that adhered to theresa may's red lines or involved the abolition of free movement of people that's the crucial point there was no earthly way you could do that without threatening the intent and the spirit of the good friday agreement and do you know of all the things that we took quite a lot of abuse and quite a lot of criticism and, and, you know, it has to be water off a duck's back most of the time. But of all the areas where particularly vitriolic attacks were launched upon people like me, this was the one that upset me the most. Because it was about a peace process. It was about a hard-won peace. It was about freeing the streets of Northern Ireland, of the kind of scenes that have now been unfolding for a few days. And, and look, it is simplistic and it is wrong to chalk it all up as a, as a direct consequence of the so-called protocol. The protocol being, of course, a crucial part of the withdrawal agreement. So when a complete clown like Kate Hoey today tries to separate one from the other, the, the, um, the, 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 I don't even know if dishonesty is the word to describe that. I think it's weapons-grade stupidity. I think it is almost ingrained ignorance to, to the point of your personal identity demands that you can't understand, that you fail to understand, that you refuse to understand the consequences of your own action. And yes, uh, it is the same Kate Hoey who, of course, wrote an article not that long ago, in fact, at roughly the same time, I think, that Boris Johnson was delivering that completely dishonest speech. It was Kate Hoey who wrote, Brexit won't hurt Northern Ireland at all. Instead, it will brighten its future. Today, uh, and uh, I thank the producer for this, because Kate Hoey, I discover, has blocked me on Twitter. Today, she tweets, the protocol has destabilised Northern Ireland. 
The protocol was a crucial part of the withdrawal agreement that she was a cheerleader for. Now, I honestly don't think she's bright enough to understand that. I, I think it would be unfair to call her dishonest. I just think she's incredibly stupid. And the risks, they are literally playing with fire. It's not even a figure of speech, given the scenes that have been unfolding on those streets over the last few nights. Placing a border between Great Britain and Northern Ireland without the consent of the pro-union community has been the trigger for this unacceptable violence. So there is Kate Hoey blaming it on Brexit while lacking the brain power to realise that she's blaming it on Brexit. I don't, for the record, blame it entirely on Brexit. There's no earthly way that a 13-year-old lad lobbing a brick at a police officer is doing so because he's worried about checks upon seed potatoes coming in to ports in Northern Ireland. He's doing it because he's bored, because he's been manipulated, because there are sinister forces at play, uh, forces that benefit from chaos and destruction. But if Kate Hoey says it's because of Brexit, despite not being bright enough to realise that's what she's actually saying, who are you to argue that you know that there was a picture someone posted the other day john hume and, and, and seamus mallon walking on a beach and the legacy that those men left to the land of my fathers has been put under mortal threat by the selfishness the dishonesty and the flag-wrapped stupidity of Boris Johnson and his cronies. Jacob Rees-Mogg on this programme claiming that warnings about what was likely to happen in Ireland in the event of Brexit, poo-pooing it, dismissing it as a red herring. Man alive. And still, I imagine there are people listening to this programme who somehow still think that, that he's on their side, that he speaks for them. Theresa May gave the DUP a billion pounds to try to avoid this situation, and the DUP carked it. Boris Johnson, I'm going to play that speech again, I apologise, we'll go straight to Derry afterwards, because Ben is waiting. But just think about this. Think about what this man has done to the Good Friday Agreement, has done to the island of Ireland, and has done to the very basic, the most basic, relationship between politics and truth. This is him speaking three years ago about the absolute impossibility of any Conservative government doing exactly what he did within months of winning the last general election. It, it actually, even for a very close chronicler of this corruption like me, it beggars belief the sheer depth and extent of the dishonesty and hypocrisy contained within this 60 second clip is catastrophic for this country. Because, of course, it's not just the Good Friday Agreement that's under mortal threat today. It's the very United Kingdom itself. Now, I, I may not be somebody who would mourn a united island, particularly, but if I'd voted to make Britain great again, and I'd ended up seeing it diminished, reduced, divided, split, then I completely understand why perhaps you're not quite ready yet to admit to yourself just how completely you've been conned by this man. We will be damaging the fabric of the Union with regulatory checks and even customs controls between Great Britain and Northern Ireland if we genuinely wanted to do free trade deals, if we wanted to cut tariffs on, as we should, by the way, on food from, uh, to make food cheaper for our people for, from Sub-Saharan Africa or whatever, if we wanted to vary our regulation, then we would have to leave Northern Ireland behind as an economic semi-colony of the EU. And we would be damaging the fabric of the Union with regulatory checks and even customs controls between Great Britain and Northern Ireland on top of those extra regulatory checks down the Irish Sea that are already envisaged in the withdrawal agreement. Now, I have to tell you, no British Conservative government could or should sign up to any such arrangement. Yeah. And so... Cheered to the rafters for pledging that no Conservative government could ever do precisely what he did within moments of becoming Prime Minister. Did you know that clip of, of Johnson? Obviously, it's the Irish angle that concerns and... Uh, uh, and upsets us today, but that sub-Saharan Africa line as well. 
You're looking for, you know, why, do you, why are you cracking on with this? Well, I know I was picking up at, uh, at the time, but I wish other people had been. So we're doing all of this so that we can buy food from sub-Saharan Africa, are we? Right. Okay. Most of sub-Saharan Africa presumably c comes under EBA anyway. So it'll be tariff-free trade under the everything but arms agreements for the world's most poor... Co God, it's like deja vu, isn't it? Keith, you might have to get the tin out today. Give it a shake, because if I get to the end of this hour without saying I told you so, it'll be a bloody miracle. Ben's in Derry. Ben, what would you like to say? If I say I told you so. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. Basically, that's straight away, like, you put the nail on the head. You have three things you could have. You could have your Brexit. You could have a border in Ireland. Or you could have a border in the Irish Sea. You, um, you, you, you couldn't have Brexit without having one or the other. Uh, unless it was an EFTA Brexit or an EEA Brexit, you yeah, couldn't no, abolish that, freedom of movement. They, Once you but they made that call years ago. They they, they've made that call and they've moved on. And <laughs> since then, this was this was always going to happen. This was coming down the line. I'm I'm 23 years old. I was born the same year of the Good Friday Agreement. I've grown up in a peaceful country. I've grown up not knowing what my gen the generation before me knew, yeah. which was guns being pointed at you which was bombs going off during school assemblies, which was um, having to get buses into town, getting off, towns having gates in them, and walking into town because cars couldn't drive up into towns. That, uh, that situation is foreign to me, that idea. That's like a third world country, but that was the country that I was born into. And I never thought growing up that we would return to something like that. And slowly but surely, I'm starting to get worried. Well, I, I mean, I am as well starting to get worried. Uh, it's not it's not where my people come from. But the and, and the, the, the immediate response I have, and I'm sure you do too, is, let. I mean, we we all hope that things don't get worse. Can oh, you... I, I, like, go on. I think it's wrong to raise rhetoric and yes. say that this violence is crazy because I think there is a big difference between 40 years ago and I think it's the proportion of people that are involved in this. I think that at the end of the day, one of the main factors, we've always talked, there's multiple factors here. One of the key factors here is social deprivation. Yes. And these areas that are doing this, there's a reason it's not Helens Bay or Balmina or some other province areas that are up in arms. These kind of areas are areas that lack opportunities. These working class areas of Belfast in the past, young Protestant men would have maybe had jobs in the factories and shorts and the shipyards, whatever, back in the day that don't exist anymore. These guys lack opportunity, so they lash out. And they don't. They need a reason. The reason's very simple. There's multiple. You could. It could be Brexit. It could be this uh, funeral. Um, the Bobby story funeral. Just for people story, not exactly. following things as closely as you are, it, it, there was a, a funeral of a senior IRA figure last summer, which breached multiple COVID guidelines. Two thousand people attended, and the uh, police what? service of Northern Ireland announced last week that there wouldn't be any prosecutions. But it, 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 I mean, even that you can't see in isolation, can you? Because it's sect no. it's sectarian division that in that in because no one would have been what? that angry about someone over the road breaking the COVID rules. But it was the flipping, no. it was that lot that did it, which is where the anger. <laughs> Exactly. It's the this and them um, of the whole thing. Exactly. It's the it's the it's Arling Foster tweeting last night that this is wrong, but let's not forget about the real lawbreakers, which were Sinn Fein. Unbelievable. Basically saying that what happened last night wasn't break the law is the way everyone read that tweet, well, I, and there was complete outrage. I, I, and well, I, I mean, we will no doubt hear from the other side of the divide that that struck oh, that I, struck I don't you. Want to be on any, any side of the divide. Oh, that's beautifully put, Ben. That's beautifully put. Because that's exactly because that's what happens in talk show radios over here unfortunately yeah. and often shows is that straight away with somebody from this side of the conversation with somebody from this side of the conversation yeah. and already it's polarized and already i have to take the counterpoint to the last caller because they're the other side Gosh. and we can't we can't look at that shared future which is what we want at the end of the day one of the key other key problems that are still occurring here is the level of segregation that occurs now i said i grew up in a, a peaceful mm. society but i also grew up in a segregated one I went, I live in a town where everybody's of the same background. The next town over, everybody's of the opposite background. Right. I don't know anyone that lives in that town. Yeah. Can you, can you understand how crazy it is that five minutes away, I don't know anyone that lives there. The next town over, I know loads of people in that town. That's because we go to different schools, we play different sports, we read different papers, we go to different churches, we don't interact, maybe we get to higher education. Um, and there's groups of people that don't go to higher education these people who are involved in riding, unfortunately, yeah. who never get to interact. 
there's lack of integration and we can't build that shared future. And that's what it's about. It's about a peaceful shared future. And things like Brexit, all these things, they put that shared future at risk. And to be honest, we were building the right way. Sorry? Well, uh, yeah, that was what I was about to say, is that I think we need reminding by people like you that, that it was far from a finished job. The peace no. process was a work in process. Well, that's what we, we always got the feeling over here anyway that that the politicians in the UK cared very little for Northern Ireland. The only time we watched the six o'clock news, just like everyone else, and the half six news when it goes regional. And the only time Northern Ireland was ever really in the six o'clock news was when it was reported for violence. No one was ever really reported for when things were going right. And we only felt that only maybe Secretary of State in the last 10 years did a proper good job was Julian, um, Julian Smith, was it? Yeah, I he think so. He genuinely yeah. had support from both sides of the community because he seemed to actually care and understand and want to build in the and then, and then we sent was, someone over who'd never even read the Good Friday uh, Agreement, didn't we? I forget. That's, it's heartbreaking. It really is. It would make you, it would make you laugh if it wasn't so depressing. That's nicely put again. Like, what, at, do, at, what, what, does, what does hope look like then now in the, in the immediate future? Like, look at the polling results recently. Look at how the DUP has fallen for what they vote for supporting this Brexit and for betraying their own voters. And to be betraying their voters for years, the fact that some of those working class Protestant areas, they'll be the first to vote for them, are also the ones that don't get the government support that they so, so desperately require. And if we supported those communities properly and gave them the jobs they need and gave them the education they need, that they wouldn't be resorting to this level of violence. Now, the polls are showing that there's been a rise in the Alliance Party recently, yes. which gives me huge support for the future that a shared peaceful future is on people's minds and that a turn away from the divisive politics of the past may be on the horizon. But it's going to be, take a long time. And the thing is, it's, it's like, we're going to have three steps forward, two steps back. Yeah. The problem with Brexit and the Brexit protocol, that's ten steps back. Like, again, there's so much stuff going on, but that's just one that just takes us so far back the, when the, progress is being made. I, I, the only other thing... The, the, the bit I don't get, and, and I could listen to you all day, Ben, um, but the bit I don't get in those cli- in that clip I just played, you heard I played it twice. Oh, t- don't play it again. Well, I'm not going to play it again. I promise. We've <laughs> suffered enough. But he knew. Oh, that's oh, the weirdest thing of all. I, I, I mean, I, I don't think Kate Hoey understands it. But he described exactly the problems that he has now created. But the thing is, he knew that would happen. But he also knew that it wouldn't matter because, let's be honest, James. Do you think if that continues and there's these skirmishes in Belfast? For the next number of weeks, if you continue to report it, the same extent you can... Oh, that's fine. Yep. We got rid of that. Yeah, cool. okay. carry on. Sorry. That's fine. But basically, I, I think... Let's, let's talk poll then. Do you think their polls are going to shift? Because of this? Well, that is, I mean, you've, you've already deconstructed what I do for a living by pointing out the lunacy of false equivalence and, and, and manufactured balance that typifies so much debate and explains in, in large part uh, uh, how Brexit happened. But I, I, I can't get too deeply into into polls and ballots um, because there are elections on the horizon. But you, you can, can, do you mind? You don't have to answer this. Can I ask what you do for a living? Because for a 23-year-old, uh, as a lot of my listeners are saying, a lot of my texts and tweets, that are coming in, and I hope this doesn't sound patronising, Ben, you're a very, very impressive young man. <laughs> <laughs> I work for uh, an insurance company, which is probably not wise to say I'll get abused for that. No, no, no there's not, nothing to abuse there. We all need insurance. I, I just wondered whether you were in the business or whether you're an academic or something like that, but the um, the quality and that be- that line there, Ben, actually, I, I, I'm not going to say goodbye yet, because that line will really stay with me, because I, I, I like to see myself as someone who rises above that ludicrous side-picking that you just described. But look how lazily and how sl- smoothly I just slipped into it. When I talked, of course, we'll have to get someone from the other side to come on. And you have been critical of the DUP, so uh, there was a little element of, of fairness in what I said. But then when you said, I don't want to have to pick a side, I want to... I, I want to... I want to act and speak in the best interests of the people of Northern Ireland. Do you feel, because I, again, I don't follow things as closely as you do, do, do you feel that the Alliance Party then is moving into a, 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 a rather large and urgent space, potentially? I would recommend people, anybody with an interest, I recommend to go and look at Plugger Tool online, or follow him on Twitter, and just kind of look at like his predictions for the next uh, storm of elections next year, and that may give you some hope. What was, the name? Nice what was the name? Slugger O'Toole. Slugger O'Toole, okay. I, yeah. I, I think we're already mates be, on Twitter, actually. 
there might be a risk that there's there's a small worry there, which is there's also the rise of uh, maybe some more re- parties, even maybe to the right, so, also I won't name other parties uh, currently. Um, uh, traditionally, you know, just no, I, say, well, that's the way it no, goes, but, isn't it? That's, that's, uh, yeah, so like there's a slight increase, but I'd more... The increase of a line vote really, really something that I think we could. So are they are they filling a space? And you may be too young to answer this, and and it may finally be an area where I know a tiny little bit more than you do. So, are, are they kind of filling yeah, a space? Fill- UUP. Yes, there you go. No, like no, not, not, not <laughs> more so the because Jerry Fit for me have- was part of my political awakening. Jerry Fit when, yep. it, when it came to the island of Ireland. Sure, like uh, John James, my hero, to be yeah, honest, mine too. and. Uh, everything he represents for this county and for this country is exemplary. And we lost one of the heroes of of Europe yeah. last and last year. And I don't think it can be underestimated what he did and what one number of people did, but what he did in particular. And the likes of Shame as well. Sure. But I, I don't think SDLP have gone away. I think there's still a, a moderate uh, nationalist camp that, right. <laughs> that 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 will still vote for them. I think the lines are maybe picking up the moderate unions vote more. And I think that's also to do with a lack of a left wing in the union. There's a lack of a progress. There used to be a progressive unionist party at the stage, but they never really polled. But there's a lack There's a lack of... Um, I think it's known that Northern Ireland would now progress in a stage where we don't, our politics doesn't have to be based on unionist nationalism, on religious But basis. I guess the it vested interest... On economic basis. Y- yeah, and it yeah, was looking that way. For left wing uh, and right wing. And it was heading don't in that direction. But the, but there's an existential threat to some of the key players, yeah. some of the biggest faces um, in, in what you describe, a genuine existential threat. In but, that, and their reason to exist disappears if the direction exactly, of traffic follows what you've just done. That's exactly what it is. So they exist and they feed off this... And that's why, look at the case, why would certain parties still talk to paramilitaries and still support them? Why does that happen? And that's like, why, why, why do they let them continue to run some of these communities? And they act, they're, not, they're not paramilitaries. I don't even want to use that word. They're drug cartels. That's what they are, really. And why, why do people want drugs in these areas? It's because there's a lack of opportunities. That's, that's the only reason people ever really go down that alley is because they don't, they need an outlet, they need some sort of stimulation in life. And, more, and there's a real lack of it in these communities because they're underinvested. It's the same reason that, that, that causes the violence on the streets, isn't it? A combination exactly. of, of deprivation, boredom, and a sense of, of, of almost disenfranchisement and disillusionment. And the more vulnerable a population is, the, the more susceptible they are to, to extremist demagogues, as, as we all know. I can't, I've got to crack on. I've got the news yeah, coming no up, but can I, hang on. Because you you had a swing at, at, at talk at phone in radio, uh, quite rightly, because I completely agreed with your description. However, I'm going to use you now, Ben in Derry, as as an example of why this medium can occasionally be incredibly powerful, important, and valuable. And on, and, and on this occasion, it's, not, it's entirely down to you. It's not the it's not the whole industry or the media or such. It's it's, it's how it's set up. So you, it, it can be the decision of it's an editorial decision. You can make the decision that we want to have a broad range of ideas and we want to hear honest opinions or you can have the opinion that we had this idea, we need to lead something the exact opposite to balance this for the sake of a so-called balance. Whereas just because, if I say it's it's daytime, you say no, it's night for balance reasons, that's, that's not going to solve any issues. Just put your head out the door and have a look. Ben, thank you. Uh, not just okay. for not just for your um, uh, rather long and brilliant contribution to this program, but but also for um, reminding me why why we come to work every day. By popular request, we we will um, get as much of that conversation with Ben uh, in Derry there uh, uh, up online on on the old clips as soon as we can. And if you're still listening, Ben, I, I have to tell you, I can't remember the last time we had a response like that to, to a caller. I, I mean, it has happened before. We've had some astonishing calls uh, over the years. But with no investment in the issue except your own life, uh, as in no agenda to pursue or no drum to to thump, that I, 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 I'm almost speechless with admiration for your analysis of the situation and and of course as we've said throughout it is both wrong and a little bit lazy even perhaps dangerous to attribute everything that's currently happening in northern ireland to the northern ireland protocol although it is also impossible to discuss it or to um uh, pull the um two things apart Eleven thirty-eight is the time you're listening to james o'brien on lbc let's go to paul who's in liverpool paul what would you like to say 
Uh, yeah, what uh, what a brilliant call there. Eh? <laughs> like, um, I'm just hoping uh, Ben was it last call. Yeah, um, I think we share quite a lot of the same the same views really. Um, like I actually jotted down a couple just to <laughs> but I think he's touched on quite a lot of them. So hopefully I can further uh, develop upon what he said. And uh, I suppose what the big difference between Ben and I have is that I've got ten years on him. Where yeah. I think he said he was born twenty three. Yeah, I think he said he was born the year the Good Friday Agreement uh, you know, came into play. I remember coming through the door. Um, you know, I was only 10 years old, but, uh, and I didn't you know, fully comprehend the the importance of it. But I, me- I remember it. Like, I can't describe it to that, but I remember the, you know, the, how it looked uh, sitting on the on the coffee table. You know, and I, I knew then it was important. Um, but since that, it just seems like you know, two of the biggest parties in Northern Ireland, Sinn Féin and DUP, that were instrumental, I suppose, eventually at bringing the Good Friday Agreement. You know, to my knowledge, because I've, I've lived away from Northern Ireland, I'll go back frequently you know, a couple of times a year, but you know, I've not been in the mix, I suppose. But um, they've not really seemed to... They've not done much to capitalise on the Good Friday Agreement since. It's kind of like it was... like I think it um, was a point that you made earlier that... You know, it wasn't the finished sort of article, it wasn't the... You know, it wasn't the I, the, I didn't the, the know. I mean, them. during a lot of the conversations we had pre or, or post-Brexit, pre-reality dawning completely as it, as it, as it has done now, I, I, I was certainly unaware of how entrenched a lot of the situation still was. I, I don't think we looked at it through rose-tinted spectacles, but there was very mm. much a... A sense of progress, and and as Ben reminded us, really the the priorities should have been the poorest communities, the most deprived areas, regardless of of religious or political allegiance and affiliation. But I, I wonder again, and and this was only a thought that occurred to me while Ben was talking, that that the there's an existential threat posed to the people that profit from whether you want to say manipulating or championing those communities, mm. that, that, that they would almost put their own existence under threat if everybody got on with everybody. They, they, they need the enmity. They need the tension. They need... I, I mean, I haven't seen the tweet he referred to, but if there really was an attempt to claim that lobbing petrol bombs through the doors of buses was in some way balanced out by people going to a funeral in, in breach of coronavirus restrictions, then that, that, that would add to the idea that there are, there are politicians in Northern Ireland who would be out of a job in moments if the underlying tensions were not constantly bubbling away. Yeah, uh, I mean, I mean, I've got like, a, a personal point, really, or so was a perspective on that was, um, you know, the Good Friday Agreement obviously came I was about 10 years old, about 1998. Uh, I suppose a lot of people in the British mainland thought, you know, shook their hands, that's it, Donald Dustin, now you know, that's, that's it, all settled, but... It wasn't, yeah, you know, there, yeah, was, there, no, was, there was an aftermath of that, you know, there was a back kick to, um, to, to you know, it didn't just stop. Um, you know, I, I was 10 years old then, uh, fast forward just to the, you know, to just into the, you know, the, the early 2000s, I don't know, anywhere between the ages of 12 and 14 myself. You know, I, I, I originated from Strabane, just up the road from uh, where Ben lives, um, it's yeah. a 20 minute, 25 minute drive. And, you know, I've taken part in acts of, albeit on a lot smaller of a scale than what we're seeing in Belfast, but I've taken part in acts of rightist behaviour at that age, um, you know, throwing bricks and, um, Did you? and paint bombs. Did yes, you know why yes. you were there? And, and I, I know, think I'm going to use the word correctly. Were you just there for the crack? <laughs> You're using it spot on. <laughs> um, and, and, yeah, you know what? I, I'm not I, endorsing I, it or I, making light of it in any way, oh, obviously. No, I'm just no, pointing no, out no. That, that you were not exactly a political firebrand when you were engaging in that sort of behaviour. Oh, God, no, no, no. I grew up in a national... Like, Stavans a heavily nationalist area anyway, or, you know, traditionally. Um, right. it, it is. Um, so, you know, growing up there, you know, you just you get soaked into, you know, you, yeah. you know at that age. Um, you Peer know, pressure, like boredom, all of the above. The kind of things, like, and that's not to... That's not to ex- use the behaviours, but there are reasons perhaps. And um, you know, at that I wasn't I wasn't at that point one of these forward thinking at twelve years old, I wasn't thinking, you know, what I could, you know, substantially be when I grew up. No, I, no, I, I get and this is this is why I mean <clears throat> albeit that this obviously ha- has the Northern Ireland protocol running through it like Blackpool through a stick of rock. It is it is not the whole stick of rock at, at risk of stretching my analogy too far. There is an awful lot going on and the idea that some twelve year old with a petrol bomb is 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 embarked upon a a, a Che Guevara style political mission is clearly pants. I mean, he's, he's he's getting a kick out of 
out of the trouble, out of the chaos. But of course, there are people behind the scenes, whether they are so-called paramilitary groups, which are effectively just drug dealing gangsters, or indeed politicians, household name politicians. There are people behind the scenes that we see who in many ways either benefit from or possibly even contribute to the scenes that we see. Paul, I'm going to crack on because I, I, I wanted to confine the conversation today to people with uh, one foot at least in Northern Ireland and, and there are loads queuing up. So um, I, and I'm going to chat to Peter Gagan shortly as well, who's um, a, a journalist from the region. Kardar is in Belfast. Kardar, what can you tell us? Hi, James. Um, I moved to Belfast uh, nine years ago with my family from Canada. Um, we moved to a region we thought was moving forward, uh, economically moving forward in terms of the peace process. Well, it was. And last night, it, it was. You're, yeah. you're right. Yeah. yeah. And last <laughs> night, I got a text saying, is this your first uh, trouble-like event? Oh. And, you know, I made it almost nine years. Um, Gosh. And it was. And we have to look at why. And it's a lack of leadership. You know, Ben got it spot on about sort of the social deprivation and and your last caller about how, you know, a 12 year old doesn't understand what they're yeah. doing. And the first night of protest a week ago, it was a 13 year old who got arrested and they're going to have a criminal record for the rest of their life. That's right. Yeah. It is this lack of leadership, which is causing a real threat to this place. I mean, last night, Boris Johnson said he's deeply concerned about the violence. I'm glad he finally realized that we exist. Uh, he's in um, Cornwall at the moment, um, uh, uh, looking at shops that are going to reopen. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad he's doing something with this time. Um, but it's the fact that they don't... I'm, I, I would be a Republican. I would support a United Ireland. So I'm not a big fan of the British government. However, if we are part of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, as the passports say, you yeah. have to... You have to have leadership over a place that you claim to govern. And there isn't one unless we're using some political strategy to speak at the DUP conference and, you know, try and stop. But that, that is even, even for someone who's got his face up to the flipping window of, of, of Brexit as tightly as I've had over the last few years, I still marvel sometimes at the sheer duplicity of it because that speech, which I'd forgotten, I hadn't forgotten the sort of drunken promise that he made to a room full of business people that there'd be no checks on any goods crossing the Irish Sea. But I'd forgotten that speech because the depth of the of the depravity, the the the, the, the dishonesty is is breathtaking. He's describing as impossible exactly what he did, and his reasons for describing it as impossible were sound. Yes, but, but the reason he was described as possible is because he wanted to make a run for the leadership. Yeah, of and course, it was did. entire self-interest. Are you, are you worried yes. about the decision you've taken then as a family? Nine years is a lot. I, I don't know if you mentioned your family or whether it was just you that moved. Uh, yeah, no, it's the whole family. Um, I will be honest, yes. Oh, um, God. You know, there's talks about moving down south. Yeah. Um, and maybe because it is hard trying to... I'm 20 years old. Um, it is hard right. trying to... Uh, you know, I, I have my it's friends. Scary. I mean, they're, they're the violence, astonishing but, but scenes. Is, they might they might be familiar you know, to people of a certain age on both sides of the Irish Sea, but for someone like you, you you've spent your formative years growing up in what was a, I, I know, a flawed but forward moving country, and and the fear yeah, and that that's the it. yeah, God, man. and you know, the violence isn't that far away from where I live, and it's the fact that. There is this lack of leadership, and if you look at, say, our first minister, who's the leader of the DUP, Arlene Foster, hmm. she's refusing to meet with the chief constable. However, she met with the Loyalist Communities Council. Uh, quite a lot of people which, have made that point, and it is historically factual. I mean, you could go further. She's calling for the resignation of the of the police chief yes. while and meeting she, with... As, yeah. So, sorry, and as Ben brought up yesterday, I'm uh, sorry, earlier, about how it's, it's a sort of double standard, and I think that's you know, blaming Sinn Féin or trying to compare uh, what happened last night with attending a funeral um, over, you know, just about a year ago. Uh, I'd hear you. And, and it's, I mean, your perspective is particularly valuable to us because in, in a sense you're both an insider and an outsider. I, 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 I hope we can talk again. God, the younger generation have done as proud today, says O'Brien, sounding about 150 years old, thankfully. Um, Cormac Smith, who is a, a, a former Irish diplomat, I, just, I don't know if it is former actually, but I do know he's even older than me, he's 58, he says, Ben was amazing. Um, it gives old men like me and you, cheers for that Cormac, <laughs> a real hope, as indeed does Cardar, although you have to hope that the 
things get better and his family can stay put. Uh, the situation in Northern Ireland will concern us until then and quite possibly tomorrow as well because I, I, I feel that this is... Um, this is so important. I, I mean, where do you even begin if you're, if you're in a country led by a man who described as unconscionable an action that he then took. I mean, I can't, never mind proroguing Parliament and misleading the Queen, breaking international law, oh, or being prepared to break international law. Um, uh, there's loads of questions still to be answered about how so much public money made its way into the pockets or the bank accounts of, of Jennifer R. Curie, um, and why she attended these, these tours with him when she doesn't appear to have had much business in the conventional sense of the term, uh, being there, I mean, all of that, it just, it's almost Trumpian already, and he's not even been in the job for two years yet. It's almost Trumpian already, that the, the sense that there's just so much of it now, you don't know where to start. But when you hear a clip of a fella describing as impossible and unconscionable an action that he then took, and which then caused precisely the problems that he himself described, you do wonder how far down the rabbit hole we've already got without actually realising that we've lost sight of the daylight. Peter Gagan, for my money, is one of the journalists um, to whom we turn when we need a dose of daylight. He's the investigations editor at Open Democracy and the author of the Sunday Times bestseller, Democracy for Sale. He's also a man with a deep personal investment in Northern Ireland. And, and so I, I turn to him really as a part of my promise to, to get as many Northern Irish voices as possible on the programme today, including experts. I hope you don't mind being described as such, Peter. Just give us an idiot's guide, if you would, to what's going on. James, uh, thanks very much for having me on. I'm going to, I'm going to. Before you claim my Northern Irishness, I'm from just over the border, of not too far over the border yes. in the Republic. So just, just <laughs> for all the Longford listeners, I'm going to have to. Do this. But, uh, I yeah, well, Longford, Longford's a story in itself, isn't it? But it we should, is we'll story, save that yeah, for yeah. another day. <laughs> we'll save that for another day. But what, what, what we're seeing at the moment is, is you know, it's in, in some ways we've seen violence in the streets of Northern Ireland. You know, we've uh, people would know the troubles, obviously, which ended in 1998 with the peace agreement. But we have seen, particularly amongst loyalists, because what we're seeing at the is a lot of flashpoints happening in loyalist areas. We saw a lot of violence and burnt out bus, I'm sure some of the listeners mm. saw images on social media, awful images, you know. So a, a, a conductor in a bus and, and passengers having to be taken off it in Belfast last night. This follows a number of days of violence in, in Derry, in Carrick Fergus and other parts of Northern Ireland. You know, and in some ways you can say, look, what, what's causing this? What's the root cause? If you listen to the Democratic Unionist Party, Tardine Foster, the, the root cause is a, a funeral of a former senior IRA man, a guy called Bobby Story, who who died during COVID, that there was rules broken around the pandemic and recently the police constable of Northern Ireland said that there's not going to be prosecutions in relation to his funeral. Lots of people were out for his funeral. They're saying, look, that should have been prosecutions. Foster has called for the PSNI chief to resign and, you know, people are saying, well, that's why the rioting has happened. It's a direct result from Bobby's story. But I think there's also a lot of other things going on in Northern Ireland beyond just this one incident, you know, and you talk there about Boris Johnson. The protocol is a big part of this, the Northern Irish Protocol, which is basically the sea border that now exists between Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom as part of Brexit. And, you know, you can't stand away from the fact that for four or five years now, Boris Johnson and other conceding Conservatives told the Unionists in Northern Ireland that nothing would change. Everything but this is, this is the bit... Is, this is, is, a lot has changed. Yeah, and this is the bit where perhaps people either don't care or, or they have to look the other way because they the alternative is to acknowledge that they've been conned themselves. Or, like me, they just feel epic confusion, really. Brandon Lewis, I think as recently as January, was trying to claim that there was no border in the Irish Sea. And here we are now in April. Yes, well, he, that, there's been a complete denial from the British government. And, and I think what's happened is, you know, to, to kind of zoom the lens out, what we've had is since the Brexit referendum, you've talked about this a lot on your show. We've <laughs> once had or twice. People, you know, <laughs> once or twice. And we've had this big, you know, a very, very we've talked a lot about sovereignty. Yeah. Britain needs, it can have nothing to do with the rest, of, the rest of Europe. It has to be completely sovereign to make its own decisions. But there's a real problem with that. And people like me have been talking about it. And to be fair, you've been talking about it too for a good few years. Mm. The Good Friday Agreement effectively says that a part of the United Kingdom, Northern Ireland, you know, is also potentially can become part of the rest of the Republic of Ireland in the future. It's a shared space. It's a shared territory. So this idea, this sovereignist dream that you can stand completely alone in the White Cliffs of Dover and do whatever you want, it collapses in Northern Ireland. Mm. And the problem is, the more this language has been used in Northern Ireland, the more we've seen this kind of tensions flaring up. Because people, and it's worth remembering, a majority of unionists, a majority of loyalists, 
voted for Brexit. So they were promised this great big red, white and blue Brexit, but it was never deliverable. You know, we know that it was never going to be this, this was never going to happen in Northern Ireland. So in many ways, this was this has been in the post for a long time. If you look back, Boris Johnson appeared at the DUP's own conference in 2018 and promised them there'd be no border in the Irish. He, he would did. never accept it. And then less than a year later, he signed up for it. But the worst bit of it is he signed up for it and then denied that he'd even done what he'd done. <laughs> he said, no, I didn't do that. And we had Brandon Lewis then in January saying there's no Irish there's sea no border sea. While, 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 while looking at images of, of a border in the Irish sea where people get you know checks on goods. Quite remarkable. What's going to happen next? Well, you know, it's, it's, it is clearly quite an inflammatory situation. Um, unfortunately, we have, these have had, the loyalist rioting has happened in the past and it's lasted for either weeks or months. Yeah. You would imagine, unfortunately, this could go on. We are also coming towards the marching season in Northern Ireland, the summer season, where there's, you know, lots of contentious parades. So, unfortunately, you know, there's a lack of political leadership, particularly within unionism. And so far, we've not seen it. And, you know, maybe some leadership will come soon, but I wouldn't be holding my breath. <laughs> Look at that. He's brought it in bang on time as well. Peter Gagan, who's um, at work, I recommend at, at every turn. But if, if you can get hold of his book, you really should as well. Um, thank you so much for, for your contribution. Uh, just a, a thumbnail sketch, really, of what's gone on. And you know, what an amazing album.